it's wonderful to be here. Uh, Yoram mentioned on Sunday night the kind of unexpected influences uh, presidents have on their society and, and individual behavior. And I, I thought about that and I realized you're very right. Uh, since Trump won the election, I've been wearing my ties longer, you know, kind of. So just one, one little thing that you can see. And they're not, not today. Um, so I thought I might discuss Trump's possible impact on American conservatism. Uh, Adrian Woolridge and John Micklethwaite were editors of The Economist when they published a book in 2004 called The Right Nation. This book, which was uh, said to be on conservative power in America, opens with a description of the intersection at 17th and M Streets in Northwest Washington, DC. The authors liken the office buildings there to the left bank in Paris in the 19th century, a gathering place for conjuries of radicals and intellectuals and activists. Except in this case, 17th and M was the right bank, the center of American conservatism. One building alone, perhaps some of you visited there, housed the American Enterprise Institute, the Project for the New American Century, and the editorial offices of the Weekly Standard. In 2016, that building was demolished. Marxists might say that it is no accident that the breakup of the right bank occurred during the very year that Donald J. Trump was elected president of the United States of America on a Republican ticket. The Trump phenomenon coincided with the fierce and at times intensely personal debate over the past, present, and future of American conservatism. And Trump's election offers an opportunity to reevaluate and reformulate this conservatism's place in our politics, society, and culture. Trump is, I think, important in this discussion because his relation to conservatism is a matter of great dispute. Already, his administration looks to be a somewhat rickety alliance of insiders and outsiders with establishment Republicans whose political identities were fashioned in admiration of Jack Kemp and the two Bushes on the one hand, and anti-establishment populists who extol the virtues of Newt Gingrich, Sarah Palin, and the Tea Party on the other. Presidents happen to remake parties in their own image, so where Trump stands and will stand will let us know something of the direction of American conservatism as a whole. What makes that direction unclear now is the fact that as far as I can determine, there is no consensus on whether Donald Trump is a conservative at all. Certainly the movement's most prominent spokesman say he is not. Donald Trump is no conservative, wrote Yuval Levin last January. Trump has no affinity whatsoever for the central thrust of modern conservatism, a return to less and smaller government, wrote Charles Carthammer last May. If Trump wins, George F. Will wrote last September, the GOP ends as a vehicle for conservatism. My argument is that these conservatives are wrong. Donald Trump is a conservative, but of a very particular type. His conservatism is ignored or dismissed because while it often reaches the same conclusions as other versions of conservatism, its impulses and emphases are different from those of traditionalism, anti-communism, classical liberalism, Leo Strauss conservatism and its East and West Coast varieties, the neoconservatism of Irving Kristol, as well as the neoconservatism of William Kristol, Religious conservatism, paleoconservatism, compassionate conservatism, constitutional conservatism, and all the other shaggy inhabitants of the conservative zoo. There is no better authority, of course, for Trump's self-understanding than the man himself. So as to define conservatism last January, his response was revealing, quote, it's a person that doesn't want to take risks, he said, who, quote, wants to, in a financial sense, balance budgets, who, quote, feels strongly about the military. Risk aversion, fiscal discipline, and support for the troops, a unique but not unusual mix of conservative traits. And yet Trump was also quick to distinguish himself from the pack. He was, he said, a little bit different than, I love this phrase, normal conservative. Why? Because Trump went on, quote, I was opposed to the war in Iraq. Most conservatives, gesturing to his uh, fellow candidates, let's go, gung-ho. Every one of them wanted the war in Iraq. Look at where it got us. Now, I can see why the war violated Trump's sense of conservatism, based on the definition he offered just a moment ago. The invasion of Iraq was certainly risky. It was costly, and it put the troops in a dangerous position, defending a suspicious and resentful population amid IEDs and sniper attacks. So Trump understands the Iraq war as an example of conservative thinkers and politicians advocating unconservative policy. And it is not his only example. Indeed, in Trump's view, there are enough instances of normal conservative, normal conservative, 
arguing for unconservative measures to justify a modification of the label. Quote, I really am a conservative, he said last February, but I'm also a common sense person. I'm a common sense conservative. We have to be common sense conservatives. We have to be smart. Common sense here, I think, is opposed to theoretical reasoning which has led conservative intellectuals in Trump's view to nonsensical views by a train of deductive logic or dogmatic responses. It is important to note that there is no theory of natural rights or of small government or of international relations that claims Donald Trump's undivided, undivided loyalty. Instead, he makes judgments based on specific details depending on changing circumstances and relative to who is gaining and who is losing. The stakes are much greater in Trump's mind than mere dollars and cents. Asked during another February debate to define conservatism, Trump gave the following answer, quote, I view the word conservative as derivative of the word conserve. We want to conserve, and I loved it when he said, our money. <laughs> we want to conserve our wealth. We want to conserve. We want to be smart. We want to be smart where we go, where we spend, how we spend key phrase. We want to conserve our country. We want to save our country. So Trump, more than economics, is thinking about the nation. Not the idea of nations or of a league of nations, not of democracy or equality or freedom, but this nation right now, here in the real world of space and time. He is thinking of how to preserve it, to save it. The common sense conservatism of Donald Trump is not the conservatism of ideas, but of things. Unlike the intellectuals I quoted earlier, Trump's conservatism does not derive from the works of Burke or Disraeli or Newman, nor is he a follower like Charles Krauthammer of Mill, Isaiah Berlin, and Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Donald Trump's is a blunt and instinctive conservatism arrived at after decades in the zero-sum world of real estate and entertainment contract law. His are sentiments honed by immediate and visceral and occasionally inelegant reactions to events and personalities he observes on Twitter or, to use another great Trump phrase, the shows. Yeah. The goal of his particular conservatism is not to adhere to an ideological program so much as it is to prevent the loss of specific goods, money, soldiers, guns, jobs, borders, in fact, our very sense of nationhood. Now, Trump is not as novel as some of his critics would have us believe. Uh, there are antecedents to his politics. You can find them in the majoritarian theories of William F. Buckley Jr.'s mentor, Goldmar Kendall, in the populist and anti-establishment rhetoric of Joseph McCarthy, George Wallace, Ross Perot, and Patrick Buchanan, and in the social conservatism of the suburban warriors who fought liberal social policies, such as the Equal Rights Amendment, busing, abortion, and the therapeutic approach to crime, and who played such an important role in the Reagan revolution. But the conservative ex who actually reminds me most of Donald Trump is uh, rarely discussed and indeed forgotten today. His name was William F. Gavin, and he was born in 1935. He grew up a Catholic in Jersey City, attended Jersey City State College and the University of Pennsylvania, and wrote speeches for Richard Nixon and Senator James Buckley. In 1975, he published a book, Street Corner Conservative, that described the city dwellers, blue collar workers, Irish, Italians, Greeks, Poles, and Slavs who were in increasing opposition to liberalism and moving rather tentative, tentatively, tentatively into the Republican camp. Quote, they do not want to overthrow the system, Gavin wrote, but they are not quite satisfied with the system either. They supported the United States effort in Vietnam, but at the same time deplored the strategy of piecemeal escalation that led us to such a disastrous state of affairs. They are sick unto death of the follies and the arrogance of liberal Democrats, but they have not quite snuggled up to the Republican Party. Trump, the lifelong New Yorker, is similar to the men and women Gavin recalled from his youth across the Hudson in Jersey City. Quote, we were all, I am convinced, conservatives, Gavin wrote. We never intellectually knew that we were, but instinctively, it seems. We knew that certain people and institutions and places have claims upon our loyalties. This street corner conservatism, Gavin says, is not arrived at by natural law or by studying Plato and Aristotle or by the exegesis of Smith and Ricardo and Friedman. 
quote, it isn't dependent on arguments from free enterprise, although most street corner conservatives embrace free enterprise. It is not dependent on aristocratic tradition, nor a particular intellectual viewpoint. It's not based on nostalgia, he writes, nor on some reactionary aesthetic idea. So what is it? My words. It is the gut sense conservatism of someone who does not want to be cheated, who wants to live according to bourgeois notions of family, community, vocation, and faith, and who reacts negatively when these notions are toyed with from above. It is the politics of someone who is patriotic but skeptical of non-retaliatory and mismanaged foreign interventions, who gives precedence to the practical over the theoretical, the tangible over the conceptual, and the concrete over the abstract. Street corner or common sense conservatism is the political philosophy of the deplorables. It is most distinctive when we examine the points of divergence between it and the more mainstream uh, to date conservatism of the Beltway. Economists, for example, can explain in minute detail the efficiencies gained when the supply of labor is global and therefore limitless. They can point to highly sophisticated quantitative models that describe how the consumer benefits from the global supply chain and from the offshoring of low wage employment. It all works so well in theory. What they're too quick to dismiss, however, is the first word in the old term, political economy. They prefer not to recognize, or in some cases, they celebrate outright the erosion of nationhood by, tech, by lax enforcement of border controls and an immigration policy. The unilateral disarmament in the face of mercantilist trading partners not only diminishes objective measures of national community and sovereignty, but also carries a human cost and workers displaced, factories moved, communities warped, livelihoods and vocations disappeared. A street corner conservative responds to these dislocations with a sense of outrage and does a desire to rectify injustices that benefit an affluent and aloof elite. When Donald Trump and Mike Pence arranged for Carrier to retain some of the jobs it had previously announced would move to Mexico, adherents to free market ideology roundly criticized the move as cronyism. But as has so often been the case this year, these thinkers lacked a constituency. Beltway conservatives in this case see more interest in defending the economic interests behind Walmart than the people who shop there. The carrier deal was popular not only with carrier employees, but also with voters. It is a textbook example of street corner conservatism, deviation from principle and the pursuit of tangible goods. There is a similar practicality in Trump's stated opposition to reform of social security and Medicare. The street corner or common sense conservative sees these programs not as entitlements, but as deserved benefits. They pay premiums in the form of payroll taxes and expect to see a return. To adopt Rusty Reno's rhetoric from yesterday, they see Social Security and Medicare not as undeserved welfare transfers that feed dependency and enemy, but as strengthening universal programs that benefit citizens equally. Moreover, the street corner conservative knows that since the Republican Party has become the party of the poor and lower middle class, Cutting Social Security and Medicare today to make the actuarial tables work years from now is more than an attack on the GOP base. It is a needless attack. The only proven method of entitlement reform is economic growth that prolongs the lifespan of these programs. These notions apply to Trump's foreign policy discourse as well. He proudly adopted the slogan, American first, America first, and his foreign policy sometimes resembles that of mercantilist empires more than commercial republics. But what America first means in practice, it seems to me, is the pursuit of concrete and visible American interests rather than an expansive defense of an amorphous concept such as liberal world order. The American public supports interventions in response to attack or as it initially seemed in Iraq in the great face of grave threat. But when the rationale for intervention changes to the maintenance of the quote, liberal international system or the promotion of airy concepts such as human rights and national democracy promotion or the responsibility to protect, they're far more skeptical. So is Donald Trump. Obviously, it remains to be seen just how much Donald Trump's distinctive version of conservatism will inform his administration. But I believe Trump was elected not despite his departures from Beltway or norm normal conservatism, but because of them. He would therefore do well to listen, if he can be made to listen, to words written some 40 years ago. What is it we want, asked Bill Gavin. And I quote, we want a strong country, the strongest in the world because we aren't going to rely on mutual manifestations of goodwill to keep this country free. It is a tough world. The liberals think anyone who says that it is, who says that 
is practicing a false and twisted masculinity. So be it. We have been called everything else by liberals. We might as well be called sexual psychopaths. But at the same time, let's demand that our nation be so strong that no nation or group of nations will ever dare attack us or even think of attacking us. At home, we want prosperity, safety, and justice. In our nation's relations with other countries, we want enough military strength to prevent war, a rational America first attitude, avoiding the extremes of expansionist jingoism on one hand and isolation on the other, and a cool but correct attitude toward totalitarian dictatorships that have the potential to destroy our nation. We believe this is a good country, Gavin went on. We believe that our way of life, our values, our adherence to formal religion, to the family, to what Chesterton called the decencies and charities of Christendom have for too long been abused or ignored or threatened by left liberalism. Left liberalism is intellectually, morally, and spiritually bankrupt. We don't want it to be replaced by radicalism of the left or right. We want our kids to grow up knowing not only their prayers, but their philosophy, our philosophy. What is it we want? I'll tell you, we want America, close quote. Bill Gavin died of cancer last year at the age of 80 years old. He was not alive to see the election for the presidency of Donald J. Trump, but I have no doubt that right now, as we speak, he is more than pleased at the apparent vindication of street corner conservatism. Thank you.